Numbers chapter 20. I'd like to say a prayer before we read. Lord Jesus, we have our Bibles open this morning. We have our hearts open to hear what you have to say to us. And so I pray that you would work in our hearts through your word and that you would speak to us um, Whatever it is that you have to say to us, Lord, we want to hear. We want to be obedient to you. And we are interested in what you have to say to us in the Bible, in the book of Numbers. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Moses, Miriam, and Aaron were the sibling trifecta of the Hebrews. Two brothers, Moses and Aaron, and their sister, Miriam. They were God's instruments in leading the Hebrew people out of Egypt. And for 40 years, they were the leaders of millions of Israelites. Moses was the youngest sibling of the three. He was the great lawgiver, mediator, the judge. He wrote the book we're reading. His brother Aaron, the middle child, was the first high priest of Israel. And the oldest, their sister Miriam, was a prophetess. And she was a worship leader. She was the oldest sibling. She was old enough to watch over Moses and speak to Pharaoh's daughter when Moses was still a little baby. She had to be old enough to be tactful to do what she did with Pharaoh's daughter and, and save Moses' life like that. She was a, a great, protective older sister. And so, according to tradition, it's not in the Bible, but according to tradition, Miriam was seven years older than Moses. So, Moses was 80 years old when he led the Israelites out of Egypt. It has now been 40 years since they escaped Egypt. Moses is 120 years old. Aaron is 123 years old. So Miriam is 126 years old when she died. The Israelites were on the verge of entering the promised land four decades ago. And then they got scared and they turned around after everything that God had done for them, bringing them out of Egypt, covenanting with them at Sinai, God said, when they turned around and refused to enter the promised land, it proved that they did not know him. That they would turn around and say, we would rather die in the wilderness or go back to Egypt and be slaves then enter your promised land. So the Lord gave that generation exactly what they asked for. That generation would die in the wilderness. 
They would spend 40 years wandering the desert until the last of them died off. God said in Numbers 14.33 to that generation that turned around, and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. The three siblings, the three leaders of the Israelites, Miriam, Aaron, and Moses, they all made it to the very last year of wandering. And they all died in the same year. They were close. I think that Aaron and Moses were mourning the loss of their sister. When the people gathered together against them to oppose them, I bring that up because Moses and Aaron are going to make a giant mistake. When we are at a low point emotionally is so often when we make our very worst mistakes. When we act out of emotional distress, we risk making decisions that diverge from our usual standards of judgment and behavior. Moses and Aaron are about to make the biggest mistake of their careers because they bring their negative emotions into their ministry. That's something that we need to be aware of. That when we are grieving, we're not at our best. And we need to tread very carefully through the dangers of making emotional decisions that we will later regret. Verse 3, Numbers chapter 20, verse 3. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. If you've been coming to this church uh, for the last month, more than a month, all we have been doing on Sunday mornings is hearing the Israelites complain, I feel like. We've been studying the book of Numbers, and so much of it is just the Israelites complaining. They started complaining as soon as they left Egypt. The first thing they complained about is what they're complaining about right here, water. Exodus 15, 22, they went three days in the wilderness. That's how far they made it out of Egypt before they started complaining. Three days. And they found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And so the Lord made the bitter water sweet. The Israelites drank the water, but they never said, Thank you, God. They complained again three verses later. Exodus 16, verse 2. The whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. The Lord heard them. And he made it rain the bread of heaven. And the Israelites got it and they called it manna. It means what is this stuff? Mm -hmm. 
Then they complained again about being thirsty again. So they complained about water. Then they complained about food. Then they complained about water. Exodus 17. Then the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of the land of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And so Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And then later on, the Israelites set out from Mount Sinai. And they started complaining about the manna, that miracle food that God was feeding them with. Numbers 11, verse 4. Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. The Lord heard them and he provided quail for them to eat. And now we get here to Numbers 20. So they complained about water and then they complained about food and then they complained about water and then they complained about food. Get to Numbers 20 and they're going to complain about water. Now, we've only been reading about the Israelites and their complaining for a month. And and I'm sick of it. These guys, they bug me. But think about Moses. I'm sick of it after a month. Moses put up with these guys and they're complaining for 40 years. For 40 years, he put up with these people who just would not trust the Lord to provide for them. Even after God miraculously and continuously supplied their every need. God hates complaining. It is a sin. But we often sound just like the Israelites. We don't trust God after he's been there for us and provided for us. If the Lord has been good to you, he doesn't want you to complain about it. Verse 6. Numbers 20, verse 6. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. Moses and Aaron, they've been doing this for 40 years. They know what to do in these situations when the Israelites come to them and they're complaining. They turn to the Lord for help. They come to God's house. They fall on their faces before him and they ask for his help. God answers prayer. 
In Matthew 7, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? The Lord appeared to Moses and Aaron to answer their prayer. God wants you to take your needs to him in this way. He is a good father. He wants to help you. He's just waiting for you to ask him for help. And when you do come to the Lord for help, it is important that you listen to him and obey his word do it God's way and not your way. His way is better than your way. The Lord tells Moses and Aaron to bring the staff and assemble the congregation at the rock. And then the Lord instructs him to talk to the rock, speak to the rock, tell the rock you want water. And the rock will give you what you need. Verse 9. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. And then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. It worked. God told Moses, you know, grab your stick. So Moses grabbed his stick. And he brought his brother Aaron up. They went up to the rock. They gathered everybody around. And then Moses goes like this. I'm going to break this rock. <laughs> right? And what does the rock do? There goes the water. Enough water poured out of that rock to fill an Olympic swimming pool in an hour. That was an abundance of gushing, clean water that poured from that rock. Praise the Lord. He did it. He provided for their needs. He answered their prayer. The Lord is a provider. But Moses didn't actually do what God said. God didn't say, beat the rock. That's what Moses did. He beat that rock. God said, speak to the rock. Moses is over there lashing out at the rock. He's taking his anger out on the rock. And then he disparages the people. He said, listen up, you rebels. Are you going to make me and Aaron give you water? Here you go. Right? God didn't say belittle them, Moses. That's just you responding emotionally and misrepresenting the Lord when you do it. Moses is actually being disobedient to God. And he's not being a faithful minister of the truth. Moses doesn't have the power to bring water from the rock but he's taking credit. Shall we bring water from this rock for you? 
He's taking credit because God is using him to accomplish his purposes. Moses is stealing glory from God. Taking honor for himself for something that Moses could never do on his own. He needs God to bring water from the rock. Moses can't do that. If God is using you, it's because of his grace. It's because he is accomplishing something through you. Don't get puffed up with pride, thinking that God is working through you because you're so great. He is the one who is great. We are the unworthy vessels of his glorious grace. Look at Moses. God still used him. Even though he was rebelling against the Lord, he was not following the word of God. He was not obedient himself. And yet God still used him. God always uses imperfect people to accomplish his will. There's actually, there's not another type of person that he can use. It has to be an imperfect person because that's all there is. It's people like you and me. And yet, we always put certain people on a pedestal and we think that because God is using that person, they must be better than us. And what we may not see or realize is that that person that you propped up on a pedestal is not being faithful to the Lord. They may even be misrepresenting God and yet the Lord uses them anyway. He can still use people who are messed up, people who are not obedient. He can still use you. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Verse 12, Numbers 20, verse 12. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them, he showed himself holy. Moses and Aaron misrepresented the Lord to the people. God takes that seriously. If you are going to represent God, it is important that you represent him well. If you bear the name of Christ, Christian, then you represent God to people, whether you like it or not, because you call yourself a Christian. And so don't squander your testimony by your bad attitude like Moses did. In 2 Corinthians 4.2, the Apostle Paul said, we renounce disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And in 1 Corinthians 9.27, Paul said, I discipline my body and keep it under control 
lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Moses disqualified himself from the promised land by misrepresenting God, by not obeying his word. If we believe what God says, we do what God says. If we believe, we do. Verse 14. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, you know all the hardship that we have met, how our fathers went down to Egypt, and we lived in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians dealt harshly with us and our fathers. And when we cried to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. And here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard or drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. But Edom said to him, you shall not pass through lest I come out with the sword against you. And the people of Israel said to him, we will go up by the highway. And if we drink of your water, I and my livestock, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. But he said, you shall not pass through. And Edom came out against them with a large army and with a strong force. Thus, Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. That 40 years of wandering that God told Israel they were going to do, that's over now. It's been 40 years. Israel has the blessing from God to enter the promised land. They will now have his help in conquering it. They're going to take the land of Canaan that God promised them. Now, Israel is going to approach from the east. They're going to cross the Jordan River up there like North, way north of where they are, and they're going to conquer Israel starting from the east, from the plains of Moab. And the territory of Edom is between where Israel is and where they want to be. Now, Edom and Israel are brothers. They were the children of Isaac, the grandchildren of Abraham. Isaac's older son, Esau, is called Edom in Genesis 25, 29. Isaac's younger son, Jacob, is renamed Israel in Genesis 35, 9. These people are all relatives, the Edomites and the Israelites. The Bible even commands the Israelites not to hate the Edomites. Deuteronomy 23, 7. You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. But brothers often quarrel. I have three of them. I figured it out. These brothers did not get along, Israel and Edom. They often fought each other. And Moses tries to be diplomatic. First, he asks politely if Edom will be sympathetic to their cause. He recounts to the king their testimony, their testimony, the story of how God saved them from bondage in Egypt. Oftentimes, it is our own family that most needs to hear the gospel from us. They need to hear you testify that God has saved you and what he saved you from. But that does not mean that your family is going to listen to you.
the Edomites refused to let the Israelites pass through. Like sibling rivalry prevails over kindness. So Moses changes tack. And in the second diplomatic exchange, Moses offers to pay the king of Edom for the use of the king's road. Edom still will not let them pass through. They come with a show of force to prove that they mean business. Edom's like, don't even try it, little bro. I'll kick your butt, man. It is best to avoid fighting. I bet Israel could have taken Edom. But they're brothers. Violence can be avoided here. There is a way around it. It's a long way. But Israel chooses to go around instead of fighting with their brother. 2 Timothy 2.23 Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. So, the Israelites avoid conflict by taking the long way around. Verse 22. Numbers, chapter 20, verse 22. And they journeyed from Kadesh, and the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came to Mount Hor. And the Lord said, to Moses and Aaron at Mount Hor on the border of the land of Edom, let Aaron be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land that I have given to the people of Israel, because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. Take Aaron and Eleazar his son, and bring them up to Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them on Eleazar his son, and Aaron shall be gathered to his people, and shall die there. Moses did as the Lord commanded. And they went up Mount Hor in the sight of the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar his son. And Aaron died there on top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron had perished, all the house of Israel wept for Aaron 30 days. We lost Miriam at the beginning of the chapter. Now we lose Aaron. Aaron passed his legacy on before he died. The high priesthood would continue on without him. Aaron and his brother Moses and his son Eliezer went up the mountain. And there, on top of the mountain, Moses and Eliezer buried Aaron. He died on top of that mountain. And then the new high priest, Eliezer, Aaron's son, came down from the mountain without Aaron, wearing the priestly garments the old had passed, the new had come, and the people mourned for their priest for a month. The three siblings, Miriam, Aaron, and Moses, would all die in the same year. Forty years since they left Egypt together. Numbers 33, 39 tells us that Aaron was 123 years old when he died. And he died outside of the promise of God. He wouldn't make it to the promised land. But he did not die outside of the grace of God. Aaron was still a believer. It would have been so much better if Aaron had followed the Lord wholeheartedly up until the day he died, and he would have died in the promised land. He could have lived to see the land of promise, but because he did not obey the word of God, he died outside of God's blessing. 
He died outside of the promises of God. And God wanted him to get to the promised land and see the good land. But Aaron wasn't obedient to the Lord. And yet, Aaron's eternal future is secure. God says that Aaron would be gathered to his people. He'll be with his sister. He'll be with his believing ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Aaron is going to a better place, a place of comfort and rest. Even though Aaron made many mistakes in his life, he was far from perfect. He had obvious character flaws. And yet he has the promise of heaven from God. You can have that same promise. You can have it today. The promise of eternal life. John 6, 37, Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. John 10, 28, Jesus said, I will give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life and whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. You can know today where you will go when you die. You can choose heaven or hell. And it's not about how good you are. It's not about whether or not you behaved. Aaron was a sinner just like you. He made huge mistakes. But he trusted God to deliver him from death, and God did. The Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21, verse 1. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atherim, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed give this people into my hand, then I will devote their cities to destruction. And the Lord heeded the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites, and they devoted them and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Hormah. The land of the Canaanites was the promised land for the Hebrews. The Canaanites were the people that God was judging when he gave the Israelites the land. And when the Canaanite king found out that Israel was camped within striking distance of him, he raided the camp of the Israelites and he took some of them hostages. A generation earlier, like 38 years ago, the fathers of these Israelites faced the Canaanites in battle and lost because the Lord was not with them. But this new generation, they were ready to face the Canaanites, and God was with them because they sought him. The 40-year judgment was over. Israel was ready to walk in faith and be victorious. They promised the Lord. The Israelites promised the Lord that if he blessed them in battle, they would utterly destroy the Canaanite cities and leave them in ruin. They would not take anything for themselves. Everything of the Canaanites would be 100% devoted to destruction. This was the first victory for that new generation. After 40 years, finally had a victory. This generation 
that conquered these Canaanites that promised God to devote the cities to destruction, they would go on to the promised land and they would conquer it. They're off to a very strong start. And now, there's really only one guy left from that old, older generation. He's 120 years old, still leading the Israelites. The great lawgiver, Moses. And he has just been forbidden from entering the promised land by the Lord. Why? Because he struck the rock twice. But that doesn't seem so bad. It worked. What does it matter whether Moses struck the rock or spoke to the rock like he was supposed to? What does it matter? Isn't the important thing that it worked and that the people got their water? Not to God. Because God wasn't just concerned with the ancient Israelites and their day-to-day problems. He had this story written down for you. He was thinking about you. It was for your sake that he told Moses to speak to the rock. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. God was trying to tell us something important. He has a very important analogy here in Numbers 20. He wants us to understand. And Moses, by not doing what God said, has misrepresented the Lord Jesus to us. You see, the most important character in Numbers 20 wasn't Moses, and it wasn't Aaron, and it wasn't Miriam. The most important character in Numbers 20 was that rock. The rock saved the people from death. The rock became a spring of living water to them. And the New Testament has something very important to tell us about that rock. It's in 1 Corinthians 10. I'll read you 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 4. It says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. That's what the Bible says about that rock in Numbers 20. The rock was Christ. Christ. The rock was Jesus Christ. He is the central message of the Bible. And Moses didn't know it, but by striking the rock twice, it was like he was sacrificing Jesus again on the cross. The rock had already been struck once in Exodus 17, 6, the first time Moses struck the rock. And it represented Christ to us. And that rock saved the people. Hebrews 10.10 says, We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus was crucified one time. And that was enough to pay for the sin of the whole world. And Jesus said in John 7, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, 
Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus died once. He was struck once. The rock doesn't need to be struck again to get the living water. You just have to speak to him. You speak to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. And he will give you what you need. If you need to be saved... Speak to Jesus Christ, the rock. If you need to be healed, speak to Jesus Christ, the rock. If you are grieving, speak to him. If you are hurting, speak to him. If you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, don't trample him again. Speak to him. Speak to the rock. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for being the rock, the rock of living waters, Lord, and what a beautiful picture it is of who you are for us, who you are to us, and that you were struck once, and because of that, we're saved. And now all we have to do is talk to you, speak to you. And so we come to you right now, Lord Jesus, and we confess that we are sinners in need of your grace. And we thank you for being struck on the cross for us and for paying for our sins. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful to you. And that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.